Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Calm Canine Academy webinar. Help, my dog has anxiety on walks. Special urban edition is going to be a slant today, um, focusing on the urban environment. I'm excited to get into this. Thank you so much for joining. Before we get started, I uh, do want to talk a little bit about myself, just so you know who I am. My name is Karishma. I'm head of training and behavior at CCA, Calm Canine Academy. We're an international collective of multi-certified behavior and mental health experts specializing in dog behavior and mental health. Um, we work with sensitive dogs and their exceptional guardians all over the world, worked with clients in over 15 countries, and we really specialize in like complicated cases of fear, anxiety, and aggression, especially in those urban environments. Today, we're here for a very specific reason, and it's to discuss how we can support and care for our dogs who experience anxiety on walks. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. It's something that's really like, close to my heart. It's, a, it's the first thing I noticed about my dog, Hera, who is sleeping here. Uh, the first thing I noticed about him was how scared he was of when I lived in New York. It was the New York urban environment that he was brought into and he was so scared that he literally pooped himself when trucks went past <laughs> he was so scared he'd shake and be unable to move and I didn't really know what to do and I wish that I'd had a resource like this back then and I subsequently spent the last six years learning everything I can um, about maladaptive fear um, because of Hera but also because of myself and my own anxiety and my kind of mental health journey and it's really been amazing to see the change in him uh, and also the change in myself as I've started to integrate some of these ideas <laughs> into my own life. And I'm excited to share what I've learned with you today. So let's start off with just talking about anxiety. What are we talking about? What do I mean when I say anxiety on walks? You're all here likely because your dogs are performing some sort of behavior. Um, that behavior can really vary depending on the dog. Anxiety to me means that the dog is in a kind of elevated emotional state of some sort. It's very hard to label dog behavior and emotions. We don't know. We don't have access to that information. But usually I like to use this fight flight kind of framework to think about the behaviors that we might be seeing from your dogs. Now, fight and flight are like the two big ones that everyone knows. Oh, I'm just going to quickly mute that person. Um, sorry um fight and flight behaviors are often the ones that people are most commonly aware of and they're big and some people can often really see them very obviously as being fight flight so for fight behaviors we might be seeing reactive behaviors i'd love to hear in the chat if any of you are experiencing this with your dogs staring lunging barking growling and snapping my dog hero was doing this towards dogs and people and children and bicycles and things like that um this fight behavior is intended to make the scary thing go away. So lots of reactive behavior is rooted in fear, actually trying to move that scary thing further away from them, increase the distance. We might be seeing flight. That's really obviously kind of a, a fear indicator. Hiding when they see the leash. Maybe they're just walking really quickly at the end of the leash and pulling. Um, there's a, a way that dogs can walk, which is called pacing. It's in between a walk and a trot. And it just looks like this really stiff, like fast walk. Um, and so you might see dogs chronically pulling on the leash. That was Hera. And holy hell, it pissed me off. Oh, my God. I had such an emotional response to him pulling on the leash because I also have some like chronic pain in my shoulder. And so it hurt me. And it was a very frustrating problem for me. For ages, I just thought he was being naughty. Honestly, I just thought he was being stubborn. Um, but I realized that that pulling um, was him a flight response and it was an emotional response, not a behavior choice that he was making in the moment. Um, hugging the walls or sticking close to the edges to, of, the, of, the, of the buildings is com commonly another flight behavior. And, and there are more. Freeze. Now, freeze is an interesting one. Freezing, the freeze response is something we might know. Um, you know, it can happen when we're shocked and we kind of startle like that. Um, but the freeze response can also be kind of long and subtle. So sometimes you might see dogs just like standing and like looking around and acting like they're stuck. Here I did this so much, my poodle, my fearful poodle, so much. At the beginning when I started doing his therapy and he moved from fight into freeze, it was really interesting to watch. Um, 
Freeze to me also looks like a refusal to walk, laying down, sitting down, ignoring you. It looks like they're being naughty. It looks like they're like just turning away from you or something. Um, but often it's actually unable to respond rather than not responding or choosing not to respond. It's an inability to respond in so many cases. And I see lots of people bringing me videos of their dogs and saying, look how stubborn they are. And I say, okay, but have you noticed all of these tiny little body language details that might indicate that the dog's actually uncomfortable? Fight, flight, freeze, fidget. This is one I do a lot. <laughs> I'm a fidgeter. I have fidget toys near me when I'm working. Um, and dog, dog fidgeting looks a little different to human fidgeting, I think. Excessive sniffing, excessive scavenging. These are common in hunting dogs, especially dogs that are bred to be outside and do mouthy things. Scratching, itching or licking themselves could also be a fidget type behavior. Sometimes I ask my dog to do things on walks, move closer to something and he will stop and start scratching himself. And it's like, oh God, now really you have to scratch? That's information, that's communication. It's a fidget response. Um, so interesting. Sometimes we see like fidget behaviors with the mouth. So biting you, biting the leash, even like getting a little zoomy, um, all of these are signs of anxiety and uh, kind of pre-warnings, you know, that there's smoke, you know, there's fire somewhere. And that fire is the emotional response that they're having. And lastly, fawn. Our youngest dog, Ash, really taught me about fawn because <laughs> it's nothing that my poodle ever did. And I've seen dogs do it before, but um, it was really like interesting for it to be my dog doing it or our dog doing it. So jumping up on you, clowning behaviors, which look like being really goofy uh, for no reason, like really inappropriately goofy and like not reading social signals. So like when Ash, our young staffy, would get stressed, he would start like rolling around on the floor and like being kind of crazy and then like licking us cra like obsessively. And we'd be like, what are you doing? And why are you being so annoying? <laughs> but it wasn't annoying. It was emotions. And I mean, it was annoying to us, but it was, he was feeling something and he was just doing the thing that he knew how to do to manage that feeling and meet that need. And lowered inhibition, especially social inhibition is something we see in that fawn response. Fight, flight, freeze, fidget, fawn. What does that look like? I mean, it looks very different on every dog. Um, and I highly recommend if you don't already, you follow our Instagram at Calm Canine Academy. Look at our guides and check out the body language guides that we have because they're in depth. But just as a quick visual reference, you might be seeing some of these behaviors from your dogs. Uh, it's kind of some of the things I mentioned on that previous slide. Um, and the big thing that I want us to be thinking about is why are our dogs doing this? Because very frequently our dogs don't do these things in the house um, and it's just outside. And that, that to me indicates that they're having a big feeling of some sort. Usually I think our dogs are experiencing fear. I'd like to be interested in hearing what emotions you would label, um, give your dogs the label of experiencing. Um, but I often see other labels attributed to these behaviors that I think are worth shining a light on because it's not helpful. <clears throat> dogs who tend towards the fight response can often be called angry, mean, aggressive, bad dogs, dogs that perform flight, dramatic, drama queens, sensitive, or just excited. That's the one I have my voice like, they're just excited. I'm like, are they? Um, freeze dogs are often called lazy or stubborn or naughty, fidgety dogs, distracted, stupid is one I hear a lot. They're just a bit stupid. Um, again, stubborn. And we might see fawny dogs being, you know, just, they're just friendly. They're just hyper. They're just really aroused or they're just, just a bit crazy. Um, these are labels that we often use to like, these are labels that are often used that are not helpful. Let me rephrase that. We don't need to see these behaviors as anything other than exactly what they are, which is a physiological response and they're performing very normal animal behaviors based on the, that physiological response. And the thing I always keep in my head when I'm tempted to say, oh, you're so stubborn, or, oh, you're so dramatic, is that these dogs are not giving us a hard time, they are having a hard time. Why is a big question, something that I'm not gonna go into too much. It could be because of genetics, because of improper socialization, they could have experienced trauma, uh, there's a whole host of different things. I just think it's important to say it's not your fault and it's not their fault. Behavior is so complicated. There are so many different things that come together to um, influence how our dogs will behave and what they can and can't tolerate. It's not 
a choice that they made. <clears throat> it's not a choice that you made. So we have to just see it for what it is. We have to see these behaviors as anxiety or some sort of a big maladaptive emotion. And then we have to say, okay, how can we improve essentially their mental health to make them feel better, um, improve their feelings and then behavior. And I think that we've been given an improper representation of how we change behavior based off of like television <laughs> and like TikTok dog trainers who often pare it down into like one sexy training session that's really dramatic or you know um make it this dramatic kind of like television experience but if you've ever worked on your own mental health if you've ever tried to increase your confidence or change a behavioral response that's not helpful to you you'll know that it's never just this one thing and it's certainly not going to happen you know unless we make some changes so what I want to talk about next is the framework that we use at Calm Canine Academy to help us create complex holistic behavior modification and wellness plans and I actually haven't talked about this I think publicly yet only in our classes so this is like the first time we're talking about it in like a public space uh, we've called it the HEAL framework for behavior change and wellness and it was really created because people would come to us um, and often we're like the fifth dog trainer, fourth dog trainer that folks have seen. And we'd be looking at their history and all the trainers they've worked with and all the work they've done. And in every case, there's like a missing piece of the puzzle. Like everyone's getting four out of like five, almost all of the it's right, but there's this, this small piece that's missing. And so we came up with like these four areas that we need to be considering these four like quadrants that we need to be <clears throat> considering when working with behavior and wellness in any behavior problem. This applies to separation anxiety, to reactivity, to fear, to stranger danger, to resource guarding. Obviously the individual pieces of the puzzle change depending on the behavior problem, but it's this way that we kind of attack <laughs> or not attack, sorry, that's the wrong word, but the way, this is the way that we approach every behavior problem and every behavior concern that we're brought to by our client, that are brought to us by our clients. So let's start off with health. Dogs who experience fear and anxiety in general, we need to check that there's no medical cause behind this. Medical cause could be anything from a broken tooth to gastrointestinal distress to musculoskeletal pain. If you're interested in this part of the treatment process, I recommend you go to our website, go to the webinar library, which is free webinar library, and look at the pain and behavior webinar, a whole webinar just on this one bullet point about addressing underlying medical causes. It's much more than I can talk about today, but I want you to think that, what I want you to know is that it's more common than you think. I read a study or something the other day that suggested, it was like one study that said 80% of dogs with aggression and behavior problems will have some sort of medical um, underlying factor, contributing factor. As a behavior consultant worked for like five, six years with like really complicated cases, I believe that. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not necessarily, but I believe it because I've seen it. And even if you think your dog is fine, um, we're going to go want to watch that webinar. So go and watch that after this. <laughs> and then we'll, uh, you'll have a little bit more of an understanding. And the second thing I want you to think about is treating chronic stress and anxiety appropriately. The webinar, Pain and Behavior, does actually go into this a little bit. Um, but if you live in the middle of New York City and you have to take your dog outside to use the bathroom every day and they are so scared every single day, we might need to be managing that stress with anxiety medication. And I always say to folks like, you know, their dogs are shaking outside or, you know, reacting to everything. And they're like, oh, we should just wait and see. And I'm like, well, if not your dog, then, you know, who, which sort of a dog would be a candidate for anxiety meds? Because so many of my clients are in really quite extreme situations, like an urban center with a really, really reactive dog, but they're reluctant to go to the vet. And I always ask like, which scenario do you think would warrant going to the vet? Because for lots of the time when I'm talking to people, actually, they're talking to me about some quite challenging scenarios. You know, I have kids and a full time job and I work in the middle of L.A. Um, and I have, a, you know, a dog that's really reactive and you know, that's really challenging. <laughs> we're going to want to we're going to make want to make sure that we're doing everything to help you and that dog. Exposure is the second category. We want to think about preventing unwanted behaviors from being practiced but also unwanted emotions from occurring we don't want our dogs scared every day overwhelmed every day um that's 
not going to be helpful, right? <laughs> so we want to maintain their sense of safety, perceived safety, as well as actual safety of them and everyone in the neighborhood, because dogs that are performing fight and flight behaviors, especially, you know, they can get lost or they can get in trouble with other animals in the neighborhood. So we need to make sure that we're being safe. We need to make sure that we're addressing their needs. How many of you who are watching this struggle to meet your dog's needs because of how fearful they are? This is so common. It's hard to get your dogs to a place where they can actually have fun. It's hard to get exercise. It's hard to get them out because they're so nervous. This is so common. It's a loop, right? The dog is fearful and performing maladaptive behaviors so they don't get their needs met. And so the behaviors get worse, et cetera. And it's a little loop that continues. So we need to think about exercise, nature, foraging, predation and play and rest. These are the areas that we really focus on in our programs. So a lot of this that I'm taking, I'm talking to you about, we I've taken from our Feisty Fido group coaching program, which is very dense. So this is just kind of like a kind of overview, I guess, or like a little taste. Um, when we work with clients, we go into detail about each of these things. You know, I have people tracking exercise, tracking how much they're getting their dogs foraging for their food, tracking play and predation. I have them tracking how many, you know, <laughs> unwanted reactions they're having and their bowel movements. I, I, I really need to get into all of these areas as a behavior consultant to really see um, behavior change in a, in a sustainable way and in a time frame that I'm happy with. Um, has anyone noticed that I haven't even trained anything? There's no training, right? When you go and you watch like the TV shows that are on like Netflix or, you know, the old TV shows about dog training and someone comes to them with a behavior problem, the first thing they do is they bring out the training tools, whatever tools they're going to use, whether it's like a prong collar or a food or cookies, they bring out the tools and they immediately start training the problem. So someone comes to me with a dog that's pulling on the leash, someone might immediately start teaching them to loose leash walk. But what we've learned from looking at this is that this is not a behavior issue. This is an emotional issue. This is not an obedience problem. It's a sense of perceived safety problem. <laughs> you might be able to get your dogs to walk perfectly on a loose leash inside, but if they're fearful outside, they're not going to be able to access that, are they? So it's not all about learning. It's not all about training. Actually, a lot of this is holistic. It's looking at the body. It's looking at the nervous system and the stress that the body's under. And then it's looking at what are we putting in? You know, what activities are we putting in uh, to meet this dog's needs um, despite the challenges that we're going to experience based off of their behavior? When I do programs with clients, we go through health exposure and activity in a very thorough way before we even touch learning. Sometimes we're working for three weeks without even doing any training and I get better results that way. And that's really cool to know, right? Because you don't have to start training straight away. Set a foundation first. And then on top of that foundation, we can build learning, new incompatible alternate skills. And I usually use learning methods that are as errorless as possible. So have an errorless framework. And what that just means is that I want to be training in a way that makes the animal feel as good as possible. I want to be teaching in a way that builds confidence, that creates secure attachment, builds the relationship. I'm not using any corrections. I'm really watching the dog's body language. When we do work with our clients on training, they film every training session, they send it to us and we give them feedback because we want it to be so good. We want the dogs to be thrilled, <laughs> like really happy to work with you. <clears throat> Because with those skills and that communication, we can then work to change the emotions that they're feeling. Um, and I've written here with learner-led sub-threshold protocols. And what I mean by that is that we are working with the animal in a way that gives them choice and in a way that never pushes them into feeling overwhelming stress. That is hard <laughs> that's a skill right and I see too many people trying to work their dogs way over threshold meaning that the dog is panicking the dog is uncomfortable and being pushed too far that's not learner led right because that's kind of coercing an animal into a situation where they don't feel super great I know this because I did this <laughs> for like two years that's how I was learned taught to train um and you just get better and you learn uh, and now we know a lot more about 
how important it is to think evenly along the four areas to set a solid foundation first to track what you're doing and really check the data um and you might be looking at this and, and already saying, oh, I've never really considered the activity side or I've never really thought about anxiety medications or et cetera. It's a lot within this one framework. We, we take 10 weeks in our Feisty Friday program to go through all of this. Um, so I'm not expecting us to leave today with a thorough understanding of all the different things we'll have to do. Not my goal. What my goal is, is to just give you an understanding of the HEAL framework and understanding of the way that I see this because it's changed a lot over the years and it might be helpful to you. And then I wanna think about three tips, just three, three things that you can do right now to support your sensitive dogs in the urban environment, especially. And I'm, these should be applicable to everyone. Um, so I'm gonna go through them right now and I wanna hear at the end if you have questions or any comments. So let's start off, number one. This is the thing that everyone's always arguing about on the internet. What equipment should I be using? Um, using the right equipment is important. It's the foundational it's a way to set yourself and your dog up for success. And it's a great way to make sure you're not doing any damage to your dog's behavior or health. So no uncomfortable equipment. What do I mean by that? No collars that are designed to cause discomfort, like prong collars, choke chains, anything like that. Uh, slip leads not not for me thank you uh, not for training anyway not for like <clears throat> yeah anyway uh, so no uncomfortable equipment nothing that's meant to be uh, used to cause discomfort usually I just go for a Y front harness uh, something that doesn't restrict movement and I always usually clip on the back if I can because if you clip on the front it can kind of cause some talk on the joints especially if the dog's experiencing any physical pain it can actually make it worse and if your dog doesn't like harnesses or you need a second leash attached to a second piece of equipment, which I have done with big dogs, I'll use a martingale collar, which is this guy here. And it's a non-slip. It won't, it won't come off their head basically, but it also doesn't choke them. So it's like ethical safety kind of balance here. <laughs> so I use either the harness or the collar or both, depending on the dog. And I have used held head halters in the past, but <clears throat> often only with handlers who feel very unsafe handling their dog. And often we phase that out very quickly um, for a martingale collar harness combination. In terms of leashes, no flexi leashes, ideally just flat leashes are usually the best if your dog's going to be performing fight, flight, freeze, fidget, fawn behaviors. Um, <clears throat> I usually use like six foot leashes, but sometimes I will use 10, 15 foot leashes, even in an urban environment. Do not ever do this without consulting with a trainer and also without checking the leash laws in your area. Uh, in some areas, you are not legally allowed to use a leash longer than six foot, for example. But in some cases, if the dog is safe, if it's safe to do so, if it's judged by a behavior professional and they say, actually, this could work for you, sometimes we can use slightly longer leashes to give dogs a little bit more freedom of movement. <clears throat> if we have any lungy barky behaviors, <clears throat> growly behaviors, we will want to be putting muzzles, distance increasing equipment like nervous or no, don't pet or stuff like that. And often I put like two or three on the dog, the leash and me. So that I'm like a beacon, I'm like, get away from us. <laughs> you look a bit silly, but it will work much better than nothing. So I would definitely think about it, especially if you're finding that every time your dog's reacting, you're seeing big setbacks in their behavior. It can everything, you kind of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Um, but these are the kind of equipment recommendations that we're giving very frequently to our community members. And uh, I think I'm just gonna really focus in on avoiding equipment that is uncomfortable. We just wanna be able to control them and keep them safe. We're not looking necessarily to teach them all the time, right? These can't these collars that pinch when they pull, it's constantly nagging on them, constantly little punishments. That's not going to make them feel safer. It's kind of obvious when you say it like that. Um, we want them to feel comfortable. We want them to be as comfortable as possible whilst also making sure that we have safe control over them.
part of using the right equipment is to use it right. <laughs> use the right equipment and use that equipment correctly, right? Um, the biggest mistake I asked our trainers at CCA and I was like, what's the biggest thing that you see that annoys you or that you'd like to fix? And everyone said leash handling. The way people hold the leash and handle the leash makes a difference. If we let the dog kind of at the end of the leash going around corners six feet ahead of us with just like a you know pinky finger on the end of that leash, not safe, not proactive. So I like to use a thumb grip which is a method of securing the leash in one hand uh, so it can't slip out. If the dog were to pull suddenly, go into fight or flight mode or something like that, or like go into a fidget, fidget fawn mode and like bite the leash. And um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about like how I'm dealing with the slack of the leash as well. I often want to avoid there being a large amount of slack between my hands and the dog's attachment point I always manage it reeling it in holding it making sure that I have two hands on the leash at all times if you don't hold the leash correctly it's much easier for your dog to like suddenly um, lunge get loose for example and that's absolutely not something that we want to do we want to make sure that if they did ever do something you're there you're ready and you can support them and keep them safe so using the right equipment <clears throat> and using it well is going to be number one, I think, to be honest. Um, and sometimes that means, you know, you're going to have to buy a few things and that's that's fine. That's it will, it will be worth it, I promise. Or maybe you're practicing your leash handling with just like, tie the leash to the table leg and just practice a little bit holding it, doing the thumb grip. You can look online and find so many tutorials about leash handling. So really do, or you can join a program with some trainers and learn from them. You know, there's lots of different ways, but gain these skills because it's going to help you. All right, that was our first tip. Our second tip is all about the exposure category in that heel framework. I guess both of these tips are around the exposure category. First, about using the right equipment when taking them out in public. And secondly, the goal is to prevent unwanted behavior and emotions from occurring. What does that mean? I just wanna go into that a little bit because so frequently this is where we go wrong. Just because your dog is, actually I'm gonna start that again. Many people understand that they want to avoid their dogs barking and lunging, right? We've heard that a lot probably from trainers. You wanna avoid reactions, avoid triggers. And often I have people coming to us who are avoiding reactions and avoiding triggers, but they're not avoiding hyperactivity, hypervigilance, worry, scanning. They're shielding their dogs from the biggest, scariest triggers, but there's a general nervousness, hypervigilance and worrying on walks. This can look like lots of things, right? Look, we'll look back at that, um, that anxiety slide, what they could look like. You know, your dog might not be like lunging and barking. They might just be excessively sniffing. <laughs> We'll still want to not put them in situations where they feel the need to excessively sniff, right? Because it means that they're having an internal experience and then they're essentially stimming to try and, um, yeah, to try and like reset their nervous system or navigate their nervous system. We want to avoid freeze responses. We want to avoid them just getting stuck or being able, unable to respond to you. These are subtle these are subtle things that many people don't quite realize come under this category of reducing exposure. And often I see folks who are avoiding over big yelling reactions, but the walks are still tense. The walks are still worryful. They're full of concern and like close calls. Um, maybe you're like watching this and you're like, oh, my dog, my walks feel like that. I wonder what, what do I do? <laughs> well, don't worry. We have Kind of three things that we can do at the, from this point onwards. If you're thinking that maybe your walks are actually where your dogs are worrying, you see some of those behaviors that we need to be avoiding and you go, oh, actually, whoa, that might be my dog. Well, we really have three places we can go from here. Number one, we remove the walks completely. This is usually for folks who are in a situation where they have a yard <clears throat> and the dog's very environmentally sensitive. So one of our dogs is a Romanian street dog called Emily, and she was absolutely over threshold, constantly outside, panting, drooling, pulling on the leash. That's crazy. It's completely see that label crazy. Um, it slips in sometimes. 
but she was having some really big feelings of fear and, and overwhelm panic so she didn't go for walks for months at one point she goes for two walks a week now and she has a great time but for a long time for many months we had to completely remove those walks she peed and pooped in the garden and of course of course we supplemented with lots and lots of indoor exercise fitness games and we drove her once a week to a big field where she got to just like do her thing for multiple hours so we found a way to meet her needs creatively without putting her in situations where she was having essentially panic attacks every day <clears throat> so we remove at least the urban walks but we keep nature therapy we keep access to nature we we kind of supplement Many dogs, though, are not in the, don't have the luxury of removing walks completely. Maybe you don't have a yard. Um, and in which case, I usually say we're just going to reduce as much as possible. Um, so if you're in a place where you don't have a yard, just getting them down to like sometimes just the potty walks. We literally just take the dogs out to potty in the neighborhood, just do their business, come back. And then we create a schedule over the week that meets their exercise needs, their nature needs, their foraging needs, et cetera. This is where I was at when I was in New York. And I'm not gonna lie, it was really challenging because every time we went outside, he really struggled. And there are situations where every time you go outside, your dog's taking big steps back. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment, uh, but you could be there and I, I see you and I'm gonna address that. <clears throat> So we remove, actually one second. So we can remove walks completely. We could just reduce them sometimes all the way down to just bare minimum potty walks. And often if we are reducing, we will be rethinking as well the walks that we're doing for our dogs. So there are some dogs who are sensitive to some triggers, but they can be managed past them and, and actually benefit from walks in some way. Uh, for those dogs, we might be doing, you know, short walks, walks around a very small, um, like geographical area, a small, a, more, a small distance, maybe just up and down one street. Uh, I was talking to my Feisty Fido group today. I just finished a class half an hour before the webinar and we were planning our training for the week. Four of them were working on the front porch, literally. Oh. Literally just five feet away from the front door. So they weren't covering large ground. They weren't going on mile walks. No, we're just walking back and forward, sniffing, playing games in a small area. So there are ways we can rethink, you know, are we bringing out steak on every walk? Are we, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> are we driving to quieter places and, and then going for a 10 minute walk there instead of a 40 minute walk in our neighborhood? We do think about all of that a lot. Um, and sometimes we can never completely get rid of exposure. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but this is huge to think about remembering that our goal is to prevent the unwanted behavior and emotions from occurring while still meeting their needs. And we can do that through either removing walks, reducing walks, or rethinking the way that we're taking them out into the environment. Maybe we're just doing really short walks with lots of support, et cetera. I know there'll be lots of questions around this area <laughs> and I'll address them after I've finished. Um, so uh, just hang there, hang tight for a moment. <laughs> So we've talked about using the right equipment. We've talked about reducing exposure. There is a third area that I think we can all benefit from, which is offering active support to our dogs. And uh, this is a dog from one of our group coaching programs online. Everything we do is online and they send us videos of the work that they've been doing. And um, the big lesson that they were learning in this week was how to offer the anxious dog support to minimize their exposure to triggers that they can't really avoid. Um, so I always give the guardians, first of all, if you're gonna be actively supporting your dogs, you're gonna to have to be present, no phones, you know, two hands on the leash, be prepared, have food or their toys, whatever they are, is gonna help them the most. Like for my dog Hera, it's a ball. For Ash, it's 
cheese, <laughs> right? What is it that's going to help your dogs the most? Be prepared. You have to have that with you on every walk because you're there to support them. <clears throat> and you have to be present with them and have the energy to be there and help them. That's often the hardest part. No lie. Like that's often the hardest part is to like be able to show up with that energy for them. And then often our goal with like active exposure management is to essentially provide positive distractions to literally we don't want them even worrying about the trigger and the big lesson that I want people to learn is that there are times when you can be learning and teaching your dogs how to behave and how to feel around their triggers and then there are non-learning moments there are learning moments and non-learning moments every walk cannot be a learning moment you cannot be training on every single walk right we're wanting to reduce exposure so we actually don't want them to be thinking about these triggers on their walks at all so when I have my clients going out into the world I say to them okay well I want you to take as much distance from triggers as possible and if you can't get distance I want you to provide some sort of support so in this video the dog is getting just a stream of food um while these folks walk past um, on this road and I only feedback I gave to them was exactly what they're doing now putting their body in between the dog and the trigger offering a steady stream of food not asking the dog to sit or do anything obedience based just providing support and a positive distraction so that the dog isn't fixating on the trigger some dogs can't do this. Some dogs need more distance than this. I get it. Don't worry. This is just a good visual example of what it might look like. Not engaging with the trigger, offering active support to a dog in a way that's been rehearsed a lot. They do this a lot. They've done this around other distractions too. And it's something that we slowly build as a skill. This is just one of so many tools that you can use to offer active support. But the goal is to identify learning versus non-learning moments. And then to support your dog and try get them to not worry <laughs> about the triggers in the moments where it's not learning. And then we set up learning experiences for them uh, down the line. One thing I'm not going to even touch upon in this program, in this uh, webinar, really, is treating urban anxiety. We're not even really talking about training exercises that you can do to improve it. I can't do it all in an hour. And you have to do these three things first. <laughs> so start here. Uh, start here and really think about the three areas that you could be supporting your dogs before we can really even touch upon anything else. Using the right equipment that will keep you, your dog and the public as safe as possible. Reducing exposure with the goal to prevent unwanted behaviors and emotions from occurring while meeting their needs. That's hard, that's such a big one. <laughs> These are not small things. And then three, offer active support support them and minimize stress when around unavoidable triggers, acknowledging that those are non-learning moments. We don't want them to engage with the triggers. We want to just support them while the trigger moves past and then we can go back to our life. So those are kind of my big three here. And often at this point, people are like, have lots of questions. And most importantly, like I've kind of touched upon already, these three things are not enough in most cases this is a nice place to start it's like you know they're like plugging up plugging leaks in the ship real quick you know just like quickly doing little things that we can do to help um but if you look at the heel framework we have health exposure activity and learning we've only touched upon three little points here you know sub bullet points within the full treatment plan behavior is super complex um so i know that doing all of these these three things is going to help every dog but it's not likely going to be enough <laughs> to re resolve this um for many of them the health component is super important and i think if you're seeing abnormal behavior of any sort you need to go straight to a vet Watch the pain and behavior webinar free on our website, the webinar library. Watch the whole thing because it talks you through what am I even saying to a vet? <laughs> Which vet should I go to? You know, what am I looking for? Um, but know that there will be likely some sort of medical treatment in some way. And at the very least, we would not be doing our due diligence if we didn't go to a veterinarian. And sometimes our clients have to go to multiple veterinarians, finding an expert in the areas that they are concerned about and really doing investigations 
So I'd say a healthcare professional would be a one place to go. And then a behavior consultant would be the second place to go. Um, a behavior consultant like myself and my team are people who specialize in working with complex behavior concerns. We're not specializing in teaching, you know, sit down, stay and recall. We specialize in therapy um, and like trauma informed therapy. <clears throat> to see a good behavior consultant, you might not have one in your area. Use virtual training options because you're not going to be handing your dog off to these people to train them. That's not how learning works. Just like boarding schools can often not necessarily be the best learning environment for many people. Um, similarly, you're going to have to be the one who parents the dog <laughs> um, or who cares for the dog and who teaches the dog. And you're going to need to learn the skills. So I don't think you need a trainer to go in home. I think you need to learn about a holistic behavior plan, how to enact it. Um, and so you can learn how to support them and learn how to help them overcome their fears. I have some free resources for you guys and we're gonna send out slides and they'll be linked below if you're watching this on our website or YouTube. Some other things that you can use. Oh, I should have put, I'll put the pain and behavior webinar here as well. Um, we have a leash reactivity webinar, a walk, uh, which is really helpful for a little bit more about like the training side of this around triggers. So you can look into that webinar for a little bit more info, a kind of similar, I think it was like two years ago or something. So it might be a little bit dated, but it will mostly work. Managed walking webinar is one that I've done, which really details into the active management, active support. How do we support our dogs on walks? So if you're kind of thinking, I need some more tools in my tool belt to help my dog on these walks around triggers, go and watch the managed walking webinar. And if you have a new dog who's experiencing stress or even just a dog that's experiencing a lot of stress, you might want to watch the fostering and adopting webinar, which is all about dogs who are in chronic stress states and how to help dogs who are in chronic stress states. And it's well worth a look if you have a very sensitive dog, um, because there's lots that will be useful to you. And then lastly, the pain and behavior uh, webinar. Check those out and you can look at comcaninacademy.com and you can find a webinar library with all of these guys, um, most of them there. So learn as much as you can. That is what I would say. Um, really get out there and try to like increase your knowledge in these different areas so that you can be empowered and, and help your dog as much as you can um, yourself. And then lastly, I've mentioned a few times our program. So I thought I'd just pop a little slide here. Feisty Fido is where I have put everything that I know and my team have put everything that they know. It's a 10 week virtual program for dogs that are, could be labeled as sensitive, reactive and fearful. Um, we have eight live group classes over Zoom with a very collaborative. We do live training, troubleshoot, check in one on one with clients. There's self-study content, like hours of self-study content and between class support in like this online classroom. So you can send training videos, you can ask questions and you get really literally unparalleled support from your trainers in between class. And it's I'm very proud of it. Uh, <laughs> I uh I uh, think it's a really cool program. And if you're watching this and going, I need more, um, that's where you can go. So comkinandacademy.com and you'll find it um, as well as being able to check out those free resources as well. So that's me kind of finishing up my big three tips. We talked today a little bit about anxiety on walks. What does that even look like and how I kind of like to think about it in my head, how I frame the the behavior problem uh, we look at looked at the heel framework for behavior change and wellness as a kind of high level overview of the different areas we need to be thinking when working with fear cases and cases like this and then we went into the top three tips that you can enact right now if you're a dog guardian to help support your dogs in the urban environment I uh, just want to thank everybody who's listening. Thank you for hanging around till the end. And um, I'm going to take a few questions from the chat. So if you had questions that you were saving, pop them in the chat now. And uh, I'm going to have a little look through and see what I can do. So let me have a look and see what's going on here. Gosh, you guys have been chitty chatting. Hello. Yes, Shelley says. The heel tracking process is so helpful for me to recognize all the areas I need to look at daily. 
and be able to see what progress we've made, even if it's just less exposure daily because we're managing things better. Absolutely, Shelley. So you uh, must be in our program and <laughs> lovely to see you. And if you're in our programs, we give our clients these like tracking sheets, which kind of fall within the heel framework and every day you track what's been going on. And it's like how we've been able to take our coaching to the next level and how I feel like we've been able to like innovate our services. Because when I was first starting as a dog trainer, I would go to someone's house once every two weeks and train their dogs and leave. And it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work because the guardians weren't getting the education they needed. And I was info dumping on them every two weeks. So they couldn't learn effectively. You know, um, everybody learns best when things are split up, when things are as errorless as possible, when your learning is as easy as possible. So that's what we've tried to do with these programs. How do I reduce exposure if I live in a busy area of NYC and every time we leave the apartment, there are triggers even during quiet times? Great question. Well, let's look at the reduce exposure slide here and have a look at what we options we have. This is where lots of our clients are at, Clara. So you're in a busy area of New York City. Every time you leave the apartment, there are triggers. Sometimes there are even triggers in the hallways and in the elevators. I'm seeing people chatting about in the comments here. Um, and honestly, managing people, managing your dog through those environments is the first step. Um, we would likely be unable to remove walks completely in, an, in somewhere like New York City unless you have an outdoor space. So we'll be thinking about reducing down to the bare minimum, just potty walks, and then rethinking what those walks are going to look like, what tips we would give you are likely around how you handle the dog in the hallways, what equipment you're going to be using, what food you're bringing, how you're going to navigate things like stairwells and elevators so that you're not getting surprised by people around corners. These are the tips that would be looking into, the areas would be looking into. But very frequently, when we have dogs in really extreme environments, like no one's, no, like I want everyone to be clear that like, New York City is an extreme environment for an animal to be in, right? Um, this is where we often have to think about that vet consult. When we have dogs that are in super unpredictable environments, busy apartment buildings where their triggers are literally everywhere, maybe they're even not able to rest in the home because it's so noisy, because the urban environment is so dense. That's when speaking to a veterinarian about anxiety management is absolutely key for me. So if we were to look at the heel model here, we'd be looking in the health area because likely if you're doing everything you can in exposure and you can't change their environment, we're going to have to just treat the chronic stress. I often say if we can't manage the external environment, we then move to managing the internal environment. Um, and for my dog Hera, daily anxiety medications unlocked behavior change. He was so chronically stressed in the urban environment in New York City that he could not recover. And it wasn't until we used pharmaceuticals with a veterinary behaviorist, someone who was a specialist in medications for anxiety, that's when we started to see our progress. And I don't want anyone to feel like they are failing by doing this. It's it's healthcare. <laughs> Mental healthcare is healthcare. Uh, your dogs deserve healthcare. Um, that's it. That's my statement. <laughs> um, great question, Janie. This is a good one. What do I do if my dog goes into full meltdown mode? Um, what do I do? Basically, do I walk him away? Do I, do I pick him up? What do I do? So if we have animals that have gone over threshold, so you mentioned here, Janie, that like an off-leash dog comes up to them or something. Um, first of all, is it a learning moment or a non-learning moment? It's a non-learning moment. We're not trying to teach anyone any anything <laughs> in this moment we're just trying to get out of there and maintain safety perceived and actual safety for the animals involved uh, I would treat this very much like the same way I treat like if I have a friend like my brother so he gets like drunk at a wedding and he's behaving like a fool and he's going to get himself in trouble I'm likely not going to be like please can we go this way I'm going to be like we're moving this way come on we're going to get you some chips and some water <laughs> come with me right Think about it that way. You're not negotiating and you're allowed to use pressure to move them away if that's the safest option. Dog trainers always say, I find like, never use pressure to pull the dog away. I'm like, well, sometimes you got to do what you got to do to maintain safety. And my number one goal is getting them out of there immediately. 
I have really fast response time with my dogs. If my dogs ever do get surprised and lunge and bark, I immediately turn around, move them away very quickly, get them completely out of sight of the trigger. And then I assess, can I help them recover? Maybe I do some cookie tossing like you saw in that video with the active support. Um, maybe I pet them. What is it? What am I going to do? But you can use pressure if you need to. That's absolutely fine. <clears throat> Good question from Dave here. What are some indoor activities to get my dog's energy out if walks are very triggering? Fabulous question. I would suggest going to our Instagram page and looking at our guides. So if you go on Instagram, you can find uh, the guides. Um, if you are struggling, just DM us and I'll send it to you. Uh, we have a guide on therapeutic activities. Uh, which has a lot of posts and lives and all sorts about things that you can be doing with your dog to get their energy out. But I go into my programs, these five areas, which I think are the most important to think about. So like exercise, physical exercise, very important. Your dogs need to maintain muscle tone and proprioception and movement is important for nervous system regulation so they have to move what exercise are we going to do with them they need to have access to nature i believe firmly that every dog needs to be in nature every now and again <laughs> so we'll figure that out foraging play and predation and then sleep which is also an activity so you could maybe look a little bit more into some of these areas our instagram is a really really good resource um so really really good question some probably people are asking about picking their dogs up um which can ha can be, it can work. I have picked my dogs up before as well. Um, but the, 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 I can't tell you exactly what to do with your dogs. None of the, this information that I, I can never give specific advice, but I can tell you about the pros and cons. Pros of picking your dogs up, you can get them out of the way really quickly. Um, you can stop unwanted behaviors and sometimes dogs feel safer up in their guardian's arms. The cons, some dogs, do not feel safe up in their guardian's arms. If you're being rushed by an off-leash dog, picking your dog up can be dangerous because the dog can jump and try to drag them down. That's not great because then your dog can't really defend themselves. Um, and then lastly, redirected biting isn't a concern of mine as well. If your dog has ever snapped at you before, I'd be very, I'd think carefully about touching them <laughs> when they're very emotionally dysregulated because that's a very quick way to get a, a quick bite. Um, and it wouldn't really be necessarily their fault because they were kind of in a place where they weren't really thinking, but we definitely don't want to do that, right? So think about that, weigh up your options and uh, speak to a professional before making decisions that could potentially be dangerous for you. Um, Andy, how do I know if Feisty Fido or one-on-one -on -one is best? It's a good question. Yeah, we do two services. We do Feisty Fido and then one-on-one -on -one one -on -one, one -on -one training. One-on-one -on -one training is good for really complex cases. It's good for dogs that have lots and lots of different behavior labels. And if you would come to us and say, my dog has urban anxiety, dog directed aggression, human directed aggression, grooming aggression, they're scared of sounds, they're scared of kids, they um, have thunderwork phobia, et cetera. Lots and lots of lists of stuff. Maybe one-on-one -on -one might be better for you. But Feisty Fido is a foundational course. We call it like Feisty Foundations. It's about giving you the strong foundation that's needed. And sometimes people come in, do Feisty Fido, and then go into a private program afterwards or go into like a specialty program like Stranger Danger or Sound Sensitivity or something like that to like really hit on the big problems that they're experiencing, the big mental health challenges that their dogs are having. Um, but tell us a little bit about your dog maybe and we can tell you which programs would be helpful. Great questions about sniffing and body language analysis here, which is really, really good. Um, so what's considered excessive sniffing and scavenging? Um, someone's mentioning we thought sniffing was good, but now is sniffing a sign of stress? How do we know? How do I know if it's anxiety or curiosity? This is a really good question. Um, there's no behavior that's just good and no behavior that's just bad. It's all about the context. I can smile at you and go, hi, it's so nice to see you. And that's like a genuine warm smile. Or I could say, hi, hi, nice to see you. The smiles are the same. Everything around the smiles are different. And that causes two very different meanings um, from the two different expressions. Similarly to sniffing, we could see a dog walking slowly with their head down taking nice deep breaths, moving their head slowly, looking around, looking at you, going back to sniffing, loose leash. Love that. 
Um, that makes me really happy. That's great. That's usually a sign that they're happy. That's the soft smile, right? The soft eyes, the relaxed face, you know? But then you might see a dog that's sniffing and they're pulling at the end of the leash and they're like this. And they're, it seems like they're unable to not sniff, right? They need that sniff. <laughs> like They're like, I need it. Maybe they have some like tension in their face and they're pulling on the leash. That might be the slightly pained version of the smile that I showed you, right? So we're looking not at a specific behavior, but at that behavior within its context, um, just like we do with humans, right? But the dogs, it's just a slightly different lens that we're viewing it through. Um, that was a really good question. I'm going to answer questions for like 10 more minutes, just so everybody knows. And then I'll probably finish up and eat some pizza. <laughs> um, Oh God. Yeah, Tina, this is a hard one. How do you keep calm when getting rushed by off-leash dogs? I just yell and probably stress my dog out more. That's a really good question. And I'm not a human therapist, so this is not my area. <laughs> I can tell you that rehearsing with my dog outside of triggering scenarios has been really helpful for me. Um, so I imagine that I would get something's happening and I imagine what I'm going to do and I rehearse it with him. Um, and I do think that often shouting it, if you, if you are getting like harassed essentially in public, I often, I used to shout at the gut people and say, stop, move away. Um, but I stopped doing that because honestly it stresses me out more. I was thinking about my nervous system because if I'm shouting at someone, I don't like conflict. I don't want to be yelling at someone. That's going to stress me out more. I'm going to make worse decisions. So honestly, I try to just avoid the conflict as much as possible. I also carry like a citronella spray. So, cause I have been multiple times actually attacked and injured by off leash dogs so that I can defend myself if I need to. Um, but I try to not shout as much as possible. <laughs> and uh, I have lots and lots of, uh, I do lots of my own mental health stuff, you know, around my nervous system regulation, somatic therapies that can be really helpful. Um, a simple one that I use is something called box breathing. So you can YouTube box breathing and it's a simple breathing method that can help calm your nervous system if, and give you something else to do with your nose and mouth <laughs> while you're getting stressed rather than shouting. Um, very good question. All right got a question here that's got a few folks that are interested um so my dog's threshold between watching and fixating is very slim and that fixation very quickly turns into frustration especially when it comes to dogs or rabbits that are in front of our apartment complex is there a good way to recognize when the fixation happens and how to break it eff efficiently without using aversives treats generally don't hold up so we're seeing a dog who immediately leaves the home and then gets really, really fixated, starts scanning the environment and then lunging and barking at things, essentially, it sounds like. And I'm going to be thinking about this. The goal is to prevent the unwanted behavior and emotion from occurring while meeting their needs. Vigilance, scanning would all be kind of areas that we want to be avoiding within this scenario. What are our three options? <clears throat> you say apartment complex so I imagine that they don't you don't have a yard so you can't remove walks completely although that's what I'd want to do to be perfectly honest because it sounds like your dog can't handle that environment just yet we'll probably be in a situation where we have to reduce our walks significantly necessary potty walks um, and we might be thinking about you know are we bringing out steak would that help <laughs> or would it not help and are we thinking about you know getting a second attachment point like a collar as well as a harness and really thinking about using our leash grip to minimize the lunging and just like gritting our teeth through it but to be perfectly honest in scenarios like this where we have such a small margin for error I'm looking at the health component and I'm thinking is the reason that this dog lunges so quickly and is so hyper vigilant is it because there's something medical going on or is it because they're in a chronic stress state because of the environment? And if we can't manage the exposure externally, we look to manage the exposure and the environment internally. So can we use medication to get to the point where we can just go out for a potty and come back without taking steps back? Because I imagine right now, every time you're going back outside, if you're going outside four times a day to use the bathroom, and every time you're going outside, we're having this reaction. That's a lot of rehearsal. It's going to be hard to teach them something different if they're continuing to practice that four times a day 
So I'm really thinking about, you know, can we minimize that exposure more? If not, how are we going to get the dog in a place where they can meet their need to use the bathroom <laughs> without potentially having negative behavioral effects? Um, and yeah, you're mentioning that she's very strong and you're trying to pull her away. I would pull her away. I would use my, 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 my weight, my body to just move her away as much as possible. But the aversive lure the the want the desire to correct the dog for this might stop it in the moment but likely won't reduce it in the long run if it did you wouldn't be here probably and what it might do is actually add more feelings of discomfort towards those triggers right because they look at the trigger and then they're feeling something uncomfortable or painful and it has to be uncomfortable or painful otherwise why did they stop looking right so I'm thinking very practically, you want your dog to feel comfortable outside so that they do not perform these behaviors anymore. Will aversive corrections work to, to get to that goal? Likely not. What will? Managing that exposure as much as we can, reducing re or removing, rethinking our walks. And if we can't, because of that lack of amenities, you don't have a yard, for example, we're gonna go to the vet. We're gonna say, hey, my dog's really struggling. I'm trying everything I can. <laughs> And I'm taking food out on every walk. But um, yeah, uh, it's still not working. This is abnormal. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> they need help, right? Um, it's a good question, though. It's a tough one. All right, I've got lots of questions here. Oof, D. If your dog won't take food when they're outside and finds the environment more rewarding but struggles with anxiety should walks be limited i would question if they find the environment reinforcing or if they are using the environment to navigate their stress and they need it because they're stressed and so it looks like they really are reinforced by it but it's like a desperate kind of version of that it's something i often see maybe i'm wrong i'm really guessing obviously i just read one comment but sometimes i'm thinking are they actually really environmentally reinforced or are they actually fidgeting right um and yes, I would be limiting walks. I would probably be reducing or removing them completely and then slowly, slowly rebuilding them back into the routine. Um, <clears throat> really, really good question. Um, got some questions here about car anxiety. Yeah. We've got lots and lots of questions in here that are talking about my dog is gets really fixated. What do I do to move them away? Um, usually one of the first skills that we teach as part of the learning component for anxiety, uh, any sort of kind of like urban anxiety is incompatible or alternate skills. So some of these skills could be like a flight behavior, a behavior that is a trained behavior that means move away from the distraction. And that's likely where I'll be starting. So there are tools here that we haven't gone into, you know, learning new skills that will help you navigate these triggers. But before we even touch upon the learning, we need to minimize the exposure. And if you're constantly having to use your flight cue to pull your dog away from triggers, I want, maybe you should be thinking a little bit about, you know, are these walks actually gonna be beneficial um, for my dog? Or are they kind of on edge a little bit, right? So remembering that we want to remove not just reactive behaviors, but we want to remove scanning, staring, worrying behaviors as well. Um, so just think a little bit about that, because sometimes I see folks who are kind of almost managing the situation and reducing exposure, but not quite the whole way. And that's that's kind of the the problem. Um, all right, I think I'm just going to answer one more, which is about vets here. So someone's asking that they live in a rural area in Canada. Um, And the re is the regular vet, like your local veterinarian, going to be the right call? The pain and behavior webinar goes into this in more depth. But basically, we have different types of vets, right? We have our general practitioner vets who are your regular vet at your like local veterinary center. And they are general practitioners, right? Usually they work with lots of different behavior problems, They but they don't necessarily specialize in one area. Um, they can be a great first option especially if you have a vet that's really interested in behavior. 
but I also want to be quite honest that there are lots of veterinarians who don't know that much about behavior. Just like your general practitioner might not be an expert in psychiatric medicine, your general practice vet might not be an expert in mental health medication for dogs. Unfortunately, that does mean that there's a lot of misinformation out there, even amongst the medical community, which I'm sure we can all understand. Maybe having experienced the human mental health system, we can see how maybe when it comes to mental health care, <clears throat> we might not be where we need to be as a species <laughs> well the same is for our dogs mental health care so <clears throat> very frequently i'm asking for second opinions second opinions of vets who have interest in behavior and you know have researched and got qualifications in the area and then the creme de la creme would be a psychiatrist and in dog behavior we call them behavior uh veterinary behaviorists God, long day veterinary behaviorists right vbs veterinary behaviorists these folks have degrees in veterinary medicine and animal behavior. They're the doggy psychiatrists, basically. So those are going to be the absolute experts. Um, sometimes you can get like a vet to vet consult between a vet behaviorist and your local vet. That can be cool um, so that they can like advise. So there are options, basically. Um, but you're right to ask because very frequently a general practitioner is not going to be an appropriate ment uh, mental health care provider um that, that's normal right so i wouldn't expect it from your average vet but we work with what we've got you know not everyone can afford a private psychiatrist i get that <laughs> um all right my loves i think we're gonna have to finish up here i do see a few questions knocking about in the chat and uh feel free to um, send them over to the Instagram and I'll do my best to maybe answer them in some reels or something or you could always ask them in the comment section on the video you will be sent this recording we're going to post it on our website and we'll email you all with the slide deck and the recording so that you have access to everything here because there are some links in here that you might want to click out to and explore um, but I think I'm going to finish up for everyone thank you so much for everyone who joined I hope that this was helpful um, I can't really stress enough the importance of this foundation, um, thinking about these three areas before we really even think about doing therapy sessions with the dogs um, will really set you uh, up for success down the line and lead to like exponential growth over time with your dog's behavior and wellness journey. Uh, yeah, if you guys need any help, you can email us at info at calm canine academy dot com and uh, yeah, thank you everyone who's here. I see lots of uh, lots of familiar faces. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, <laughs> all right, my loves. Well, yeah, I love doing these free webinars. So thank you for joining. It's like my whole thing. It makes me so happy. <laughs> the little anti-capitalist in me is like <laughs> rock and roll. Um, <laughs> all right, my loves, I'll see you soon. Have a good day and give your pups a big kiss from me if they like kisses. If they don't like kisses, you leave them alone. <laughs>